So um, I have some really interesting, I have a series of photos from a horse um, and the, he's, he's actually in this book. This is the book that Mandy and I did, the latest book, Training and Retraining Horses, The Tellington Way. Lots of photographs in it. It's really wonderful. And I want to, I want to tell the, the story of this horse because he was a 10 year old Arabian brought to a three day sport horse training um, weekend in, in uh, Italy. And his trainer, his, his owner had died and this very nice man had um, bought the horse, but he had no uh, ability to rate him. He, he went down the road at a flat out trot and he couldn't slow him down or, because the horse was very unique and had his head really uptight. And they also brought him because they had to take the bridle apart in order to um, get it on. They couldn't touch his head. So I just want to go through the steps that we took over three days. And we had, I, I think I had, I don't know, five, maybe five or six horses in the training. We would just take each horse for an hour and put them over three days and you'll see the progress. And we'll talk about what we did. And um, so I'm going to screen share, if I may. Uh, I have this, here it is. Let's see, oops, there's the share. And here it is. So I'm going to, this is the first picture that we have. And I'm just checking his neck. Can you see his neck was really hard and they, they couldn't touch his ears. They had to be really, careful how they just took the bridle apart and slipped it over his ears. And the thing that was so interesting about this horse's body, it was just like it was rigid. The whole body was rigid. And for those of you who don't know, know, know our work, you see, I have a Zephyr lead and I have it run through the side ring and up to this side ring. If you don't happen to have a zephyr, I'll often use like a, a rope and just run it here because there's something about getting, just taking it from the side, up the side like this, that really, uh, really is useful. Now I'm, and Robin, as I go, of course, if... Well, I was just going to say, you could just see, I mean, the worry lines around his, his head. And I was thinking about, because we're, we're I'm going to get Linda to start doing some personality um, uh, zooms. And if you look at that, the horse's eye and the shape of his eye and the white around his eye, I bet that changes a lot when the head is up and it's so tight through the neck. And he's got like this, it's such an interesting chin and mouth and a very interesting mouth shape, which I think probably somewhat changes as you work with them. Because I think there's so much tension there. Amazing how mm, he's holding his lips. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So I'll go to the next one. Now, um, what we started to do is just, I just, first of all, ran my hand over the whole horse, over his whole body. And that's when I found out Holy mackerel. I mean, I don't, you, you only see quarter horses this tight over the whole body. He was just like rigid. And this is after oh, maybe 20 minutes. And I'm asking him with one hand to bring the head down and then the other hand up on the top of his neck. And it's interesting. Um, I don't know if you can see, but there's already a little bit less tension here in the lips. Well, and his eye is, his eyes change. It's not as triangular. It's, and one of the things I want to point out is that your hand that's on the top of the neck, is not creating pressure to use a pressure point to lower his head. It's not about lowering it from discomfort. 
it's about actually just seeing if he can soften. And I think that's important because there's so many techniques there that actually use a pressure point to lower it. And I'm actually kind of lifting a little bit yeah. and because that's where to get to the ears, you have to be able to touch them there and just work there without that fear. And if you notice the neck, there's already mm -hmm. a softening. Now, Absolutely. Um, for those of you who may be new to the work, because I see a lot of names I don't know, we have various aspects of the Tellington Method. It's called, often called the Tellington T-Touch Method. It used to be called Team, T-Team, but we stopped that years ago because other people were using it and you can't protect T-Team, of course. But the, the method, the work on the body, the T-Touch work is one aspect of it. And we also have what we call the elements, the playground for higher learning which is the labyrinth and the, and in Germany, for those of you in Germany, it's called the, the learn parkour because that's what happens. Horses learn in it. And um, so we have these various aspects um, of elements that we work them through. And then we have the leading exercises and we have the ground driving that we do. And then we have various equipment under saddle. And we have the, and of course the, the body wraps and um, Robin, it would be great if you had a wrap book there. I, I didn't pull one up here. Um, no, I don't. We found a huge, huge difference with body wraps with horses. And, um, and then we have our philosophy. And there are two parts this, that are, for me, the most important. One is the concept that if you want to change the posture of your horse, the behavior, the performance, or your relationship, you have to change your mind first. And that's where we really do, you know, bring yourself with the heart hugs into a place of what we call, it's the, it's the um, parasympathetic nervous system state. And because if we're like worried or concentrated or thinking, oh, oh what's going to happen? The horse won't want to be with us in, at all in the same way. So, that's another step now. And, oh, and what I was going to say, the second thing is uh, to change behavior, performance, relationship, and, and well-being, we have to change the posture. And you'll see, ah, let me go back here a moment. I want to see how I always have the rider first show us the horse. And notice here, notice the you neck. And I'm amazed at how many people don't recognize that as a problem. It affects the horse's breathing. It affects the, the, the entire body. And that's what we want to change, if we want to change. And you'll, you'll see that. Actually, I'll just pop to the end, and then I'll show you what we did in between um, to get there. There I am. Look at the difference. You can see now the softness there in the neck. And I took the bit out of his mouth because he had a bit that was flapping in his mouth. It's a Myler bit and it was loose. And so I think part of the you neck was like trying to keep that mm. from flapping around in his mouth. And you notice I'm using a balance rein and I'm touching him behind. Why? Because when, a, and it became, remember, he couldn't be slowed down because he, he would just bring his head up tighter and keep trotting faster. Not that he was trying to run away. He just couldn't be rated. And as soon as we took that bit out of his mouth, it made, I wonder if we can see. Can you see well enough, Robin? There's a different shape here, isn't there, of the mouth? Well, and his eye is completely different. But what I also wonder is what his teeth were like. And I don't know that you had a chance to feel the sides or anything, but. Uh, well, actually, you know, that's usually the first thing that, that we do. And we had two, um, actually three vets in that training. And it's funny, because, well, part of the reason we probably wouldn't have looked for the first couple of days, because you couldn't get 
you know, near his head at that. Oh, yeah. Point. No, I just wondered, because that would certainly make a difference, getting the bit out of his mouth. But his whole hindquarter, the shape is different. He's stepping under himself a little bit more. So he was like so high behind in the other. So the saddle would also just <laughs> drive down into the into his shoulders. Exactly. And that, and that would drive him on faster. Absolutely. Yeah, which is really interesting. And so I'm going to go back here now and show you a few other things that we did. Now we put a heart rate monitor on him. Uh -huh. And it was really fascinating to watch how that heart rate changed. So this was like over three days, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. And I had, oh gosh, I think four or five assistants with me in this training. And we had him at this point, you see he's being held on both sides. You'll see it more clearly in a minute. He's, uh, we have a lead on the left and the right. And what I'm doing is bringing his back up there. And I could already put my hand there and actually he, he wasn't, he was already quite different. This was on the second day, but watch this. Well, and I think, Linda, too, the importance of bringing that back up is if when they're as tight in the neck as he is, is to lower the head is really difficult for them to stay in that posture when their back is, if you don't just gently bring the back up. And I think it's important that, you know, lots of people use reflex points to bring the horses back up, like taking a pen top down the midline or something. And one of the biggest differences is when we go on either side of the midline and we just ask gently and we are careful to make sure the horse is okay with it, is the, the reflex point bypasses the thinking part of the brain. So it shows you they can bring the back up. When we do it on either side of the midline, what it does is it like engages the muscles they need to, to bring the back up. And so it's a really different function for the horse getting a sense of the possibility and the feeling. And see, he was totally fine here with me. See how my left hand is just asking him to stay there, but it's just lightly. Yeah. And he's fine with my hand on the, on his forehead here between his ears. And then I did a slide. I, I'm so sorry we don't have this on video, but mm -hmm. thank heaven we have these pictures. But then I could do the slide on his forelock. And he and this horse was really interested in what we were doing. It's not like, you know, he was really a cool horse. His his eye looks to be to very, very interested in yeah, what exactly. you're doing. Okay. Yeah. And this, oh, sorry. <laughs> Get the right one here. Now, working on the tail is something that was so interesting. I forget who it was yesterday was saying, uh, talk about the tail. People don't really understand, like, why do we work with the tail? And when I would touch this horse, like, just along here, whoa, that this whole area, like, was rock hard. And just being able, I, I, I like to start now um, just by doing slides. And you might do slides just as little hairs on the top, and then you can do it to the side. But he was already able to just accept my touches under the tail. And what this does is with the, the slight pull that we give on it and re really slow release is acts of activates the cranial sacral fluid and it affects the horse horse's um, brain. I mean, it really helps to get them breathing and give them a connection through the entire body. And I, I just find that the tail work is, the tail T-touch, various touches that we do here, it's one of the most important things that we can do. And if you have, we'll, after I finish, I want, I'm going to invite some of you who've done tail work with horses to share what your experience has been with this. And this is such a nice guy. This. And I don't, I don't remember if I told you, but this horse was on the Italian uh, endurance team. Mm. So getting him to do the leg exercises. And at first, boy, we just did really small circles because this these hind legs were really tight and as Robin pointed out once um, it, this was the third day that you saw <clears throat> the pictures of me riding him this was already much freer and he could just let that go he didn't have to 
tighten it. And the tail already is, see, it feels pretty, it's not like, doesn't feel like it's tight there. Do you want to say anything about that? Oh, and actually, one thing I want to throw in, by the way, <laughs> with the leg exercises, they make a huge difference in the balance of a horse. But if you have any kind of back issues, don't do it. I mean, horses lived without it forever. It's really useful and leave it if if it compromises you in any way. Well, I think one thing you can do too, if you teach your horse to just flex, like just rest a toe and you can just gently take the hawk and just gently kind of wiggle the hawk, that could really help them up into the hip. Um, and I think, I think what's, you know, Linda, what you said, it was the circles were really small. And I often refer to that sort of Feldenkrais concept is that the difference between stretching and what we do is when we take, when we work within the comfortable range of movement, or even less than that sometimes, we show the body its freedom. And if you take something to the maximum, you show it its limitation. And so we don't want to show limitation, we want to show freedom. And then what I often will see is horses stretching themselves. Horses will stretch themselves, but the you know front legs they have on the ground and they stretch down, back legs they do these ballet stretches, but it's, there's nobody attached to it, they do it on their own. And it's amazing to see it. And you don't see it very often. I mean, it's just fascinating when a horse takes that back leg and go, <laughs> I've only, I've actually only seen it a few times. And I, I actually see it fairly often after I've done like inchworms on the top of the body and then done a few leg circles. And then, you know, the neck comes up and they stretch the neck and then the hind leg goes out one leg and not usually both like, like not one and then the other, but first one and then a little bit later the other. And it is, it's so interesting when they get that sense. And, and sometimes after being on the surefoot, they'll do that too. Which is fascinating. Yeah. We didn't have them here uh, in this training. This was about, I think, six or seven years ago. Yeah. I mean, we didn't have them. Great. Well, so then... On the second day, you see the, the um, heart rate monitor, yeah. and everybody could see that it was really wonderful, the difference. And what I'm doing is what we call the pigtails, just taking the rope and g going over you know, the horse with rope along the side. And one of the things that um, it's not in the book, and I... I have found it really useful. We used to really emphasize it. And then for some reason, I don't know why, in between, I kind of didn't emphasize it so much. But taking the white stick, and we, for those of you who don't know us, we, this is a stiff dressage whip. But we don't call it a whip because, you know, <laughs> too many people have seen horses actually punished with it or whipped with it. So we call it a wand because it does work like magic. And just outlining the horse's body, which we found to be incredibly helpful for, with when we outline our own body. I think that's when I really picked it up again, because giving a sense, a horse a sense of their boundaries, of their borders, quietly makes a difference. Now, you see his tail is already loose. It's not like he's tightening it because he's afraid. You know, and his head is kind of at a, you know, reasonable, he's looking at somebody coming in that door, but it's not up like it was before. No, his whole top line is softer. And it was softer the second day. You could already do inchworms. You could all, already mm. do a little bit of jellyfish jiggle, just a little movement of that, which was not possible the first day. There was like no movement. And if, if, if we have, after, if you have questions, we'll come back and look at these again. Now, this is just taking on one side. This is how we start the ground driving. And we're really careful with this because um, I don't know how many of you have seen horses where they just are suddenly hooked up, the line is hooked up to a bit you know, with young horses. And then they're driven and either the head comes up or comes onto the chest. And it's and the horse is afraid and the whole idea here is to be able to take that line and just slowly like move it up and down and then to go forward we and you notice we have a person on each side here 
And you see how her hand is open just, and he's listening behind. And so in order to go forward, I want to, I, I take the rope and I just stroke, stroke, and I don't want him to move until I go and, um, and walk. And, and I was going <laughs> to, and, and I just take this rope and do a little tap, tap on it. And it's preferable for me if they go forward on the second little swing of it, not like reacting to the first. So they're really clear. And you know what's really interesting, Robin? I'm very, I'm just kind of puzzled at what has happened in, in Europe. I, is the signals, the classical signals to ask a horse to go forward are lost. What so many people are doing now, they move the hips slightly, no signals from the leg, I mean, it's fascinating. A horse is supposed to be able to move from that slightest movement of the rider, which means if you put another rider on them, they don't understand. It's really, it's interesting. Now, I'm going to see the next one. And then I did the other side. We do first one side and then the other. And notice he's now in the labyrinth. And I, I want him just to wait like this until he gets a signal, which he was really, really good with. And one of the things that we've done now, um, we've changed this a little bit, which is in the new, in the new book. And I no longer attach the rope to the piece around the neck. And the reason is, oh, man, it was at one of the sport horse trainings in Italy that um, a six-year-old jumper came to us, sent by a, a trainer. And Massimo Dure and Silvia Terrestina, they are both veterinarians who are wonderful, wonderful Jellington practitioners. And um, so they attract a lot of really good sport horses. Well, this horse was really, I mean, he was a dangerous kicker. And um, so we had the rope, you know, as usual, just attached here. We'd gone through all this and he was fine with it, but something startled him. And we must have had probably three other horses in the huge covered arena. And he bolted and got loose. And he's flying around with this one lead attached. And I, you know, you don't dare to stand out in front, you'll get run over. If that horse, you cannot stop them. But fortunately, um, he settled and he was okay. And, and actually, he was better for it, which is interesting. And that, then we started making, like, we um, uh, parading a rope, as you'll see in the book, and then weaving this line through until we're absolutely sure. So if anything startles a horse or something happens, we just pull it out. And it's I, actually, we started that at Bitterroot. We, yeah, it was because of the horses that were that we had that one year that were so afraid of the ropes. Oh. And so we just took it through. And I, I sometimes, if I don't know a horse, I'll, I have a, quite a long rope. I'll take it through so it's folded. And I'll actually start the driving that way so that if I needed to, I could always hold one end and it would pull out. Like just so yeah. it's, it's not, um, it's just not, it's not fixed. Yeah, absolutely. We don't, yeah. we weave it through about eight loops so i'm not even that ma that many depends how tight the no it depends on the horse too but yeah, yeah. I, i've actually had sometimes the uh, one of the handlers hold the end of the rope in 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 one hand and that you could still get a little bit of the feeling and they also are responding to the verbal command as well and that's that could be helpful again just as a step if you have a horse that potentially is nervous or if you're not sure if you have no idea and remember that most of you are alone doing this. Yeah. I mean, that's, we're, you know, it, it's so much easier because we have extra help. So even if you can have one person at the head, just taking this step till the horse has no fear from behind and walk and they very clearly go forward from a verbal command and the movement of this rope against the thigh. It's the cheapest insurance you can have. So if anything happens, once a horse gets used to this, I, I, I wish, oh my gosh, 
You all, I wish we had pictures from the way I, I originally did this in Germany, because I used to do teach mm -hmm. these month-long start your young horse trainings, and, our, and people would come for a whole month. Can you imagine? <laughs> and, um, and the way we started then, we, we dragged the rope on the ground so the horse would get used to the dragging. And then, you know, that's not safe with all horses, and you have to be. And so I started, wait a minute. Step by step, we got it chunked down more and more and safer and safer. So the horse, we don't ever want the horse to go through moments when they're afraid and then they get over the fear. That's, that's what I love about this method of starting young horses or retraining, which, which was his case. Now, where am I? I can't tell which one I just did. Oh, now the next thing we do is cross that line over the back. Now, I'm sorry, with this horse, it's clear why we were doing this. Um, any horse that is a little spooky, um, a horse who maybe if you're out on a trail ride, he always wants to be ahead. Um, the, this driving from behind, and not off the head, um, because the next thing we would do is attach to the halter, not to a bit. And why do we cross these ropes over the back like this so they don't go too low at first when he goes in the labyrinth and then turns and steps around and over things the whole thing is the second tnt touch stands for trust and what we want to do is bring the horse to a place of really sound trust for safety that's a huge deal and Robin, do you want to say anything about that? I, I'm thinking of some of the horses. Actually, I think I remember the horse that was in Canada. It was a three-day horse that was really nervous when, when I remember how important it was to cross those over the back on that horse because she was afraid of anything that came near the hindquarters. Uh, yeah, the only thing I'll add is that I, I generally have a body wrap on a horse before I start adding... Uh, the lines because it it means that it's not a surprise when the lines um, touch them. So it's not always, but I would say most of the time um, I do that. And the other step that I do is before I do anything, I come up from the horse on either side and ask them to walk and stop and see can they turn their heads from both sides and are they is the fear coming of just anything behind or are the it's the ropes? And I just find that that's it, and it's that one one more step to find out is the horse concerned of the lines or is are things behind as well concerning for them and that step that's so important and they, i don't know why she didn't photograph that because what we do is step up to the side and have the horse turn the head without swinging the hindquarters around so that once you get, teach a horse to if they are something comes up behind them if they turn the head instead of swinging, which is one of the methods in some of the horsemanship, they, they want to, them to swing the, the hindquarters away. But um, we don't, because I want them to have that confidence of being able to just look and stay grounded. So it's, you know, different folks have different strokes, but that, that business of coming up behind and getting to turn the head and take a little bit of hay from your hand makes a huge difference in the level of trust. And I'm sorry that that's missing here in this. Well, step. and I've, I have like in the world, one of the online courses we have, one of the segments will be about ground driving. And I have video of, of every step um, of, of showing every step with it. Um, the, one of the questions that just was posted is what's the benefit of ground driving? And, you know, I, I, every one of our horses that we start, and we certainly started hundreds of horses here over the years, we start with ground driving. And for me, the, one of the basic principles is, first of all, it teaches them to stop and go and turn without anybody on their backs. And so you can, you can start, you know, teach a horse a little bit younger. I remember, Linda, you having this, um, the, the three-year-olds, you would have them ground driving everywhere, all over the countryside from a, from a halter because they don't know what the bit is and the weight that is created on the bit. If you just hold one end of the line, and we use very light lines, but some people use lunge lines, which are incredibly heavy. So if it's, so you've got the going, stopping, turning. Now the neckline driving is, 
lots of people ground drive, but the neckline driving is a step that I don't know anybody else that does it. And what I find it does is it teaches the horse to stop through the body, release the head and neck so that they're not, when there's any pressure, sometimes even from the halter, you'll get horses having a response of raising the head or coming behind the vertical. So what they learn is they shift the weight back through the body, release the head and neck. And it's, it's such a fantastic tool for, and if you have a horse that's nervous behind, they're usually far less nervous from the neckline driving because there's nothing restricting backward pull on the head and neck. And it makes, I, I think I, the horse that I started that neckline driving on was in California and he'd been, it was an Arabian gelding and he'd been sent out to somebody for, tra for retraining because he was extremely high headed. And he was also, he wouldn't go through a door. You would bolt through a door, like into the stall. And so I can't, you know, it always is some horse that brought this next step. And so I thought, well, I can't take a hold of his head because it will just go straight in the air. And I, I remember that horse really well, putting that, that rope on it was a huge, huge uh, step forward. And the way I started all of this, I'm, it's, the story's in the book, actually. Um, my riding teacher in Edmonton, Alberta, uh, Mrs. Netherall, used to buck horses out in the round pen. She had a very small, very high-sided mm. round pen. And she would buck horses out in this round pen. And then I was a kid because <laughs> I'd ridden to school from the time I was six and, you know, and, and um, so she would then pony the horse on her, tied to her saddle horn and I would be on the horse's back. And I used to say that I'm shorter than my sister Robin because she <laughs> was stuck on my head so many times. But um, so one day, like when I was, I, I started that when I was like 10 or so. I started riding there at the riding stable when I was nine. But when I was 10, she started putting me on these horses. Well, when I was 12, I was riding to our home, to our farm, because that's how I got back and forth. No parent to drive, or <laughs> it was about a mile and a half each way. And um, I, I went by this uh, driveway, and this old man hobbled out on a cane, and he had a book in his hand. And he said his farm, his house, like, was right over the back fence from the round, from the stable. And he could see these horses being bucked out on the round pen, and he said he wanted me to have this book. And he was a caval retired cavalry officer. And um, it was a book written by an American cavalry officer, American. And it showed how to ground drive a horse without ever bucking. And I just <laughs> took the book home. And my parents were boarding on our farm. Um, friends, a two and a half year old, 16 hand thoroughbred mare. And I just put her through these steps when she was three, just followed the book totally simple she wasn't afraid she was you know really nicely groomed and handled all her life and and totally calm but i could stop turn as robin said wait wait for a signal and then when i climbed on her and asked her to go forward she knew from my signal and we don't use the leg except just the lightest tiniest little flutter but it's i i use the stick at first and just release the horse to go forward and the voice and I like to have somebody at the head the first couple of times. So there's a, uh, it only takes a couple of times. So everybody's really confident. And um, that's how it all started. And we started countless horses this way. And there is no reason for a horse to be afraid or uncertain or go f not go forward when you ask them when you do these steps. And this is the fact that, see, I could just put this horse over the, this, um, Lindell over this horse's ears <laughs> was a really big deal for his for his rider. Well, that's what makes me think that maybe part of that was his teeth. I mean, his teeth, his pole, his, you know, like this co whole combination of everything. Could certainly could be, but if you'd seen the way that bit moved in the mouth when he, you could see it when he trotted, you could see the movement. So it, it wasn't sitting like sitting well yeah. either. And it's amazing how many horses like that have teeth problems. So um, I'm just going to, um, then what we did on the third day, um, 
we, we just did the balance rein, the Lindell did, uh, that's another picture with him. And you can see how nice. interested this horse is. Yeah. You know, such an interesting, you see there's more, more differentiation on his face now. And, well, and his neck, his, the bottom line is completely soft compared to, and he's got more lift up through the withers. There's less of that, the bracing at the base of the neck. It's really great. Yeah, it was really wonderful. And he was, the thing also, I don't have the picture of it, but when they trotted this horse out, they couldn't trot him out because when he was in hand, because he was head shy, he wouldn't trot. And right. that, and so, and yeah. the last thing we had this beautiful picture of him, the, tr the, the rider running on the ground, you know, six, five feet away from the horse and the horse just running beside him. And it's a, this nice. guy, look, it was so happy with this. Nice. Now this is, I mean, see the difference? Oh, totally. But I mean, look at his hind legs, like his hind legs coming underneath him. I mean, the bottom line is soft. It's, it's really nice. Oh, what a difference from the first picture. We have to get a split screen picture to show. Yeah the difference of, because it's, since it's the same writer. Exactly, isn't it? So what I'd like to do, I'm just gonna show this to you again, so you remember yeah. what that looked like. Yeah. Look at the yeah. difference in the- Yeah, movement. incredible, incredible. He's just completely out beside, behind himself in the first one. Right. So let's- so, uh, so Linda, Janet, yeah. uh, Janet asked out, uh, did Mrs. Betherall adapt her starting techniques to driving, oh, for ground sure. driving? <laughs> <laughs> Actually, Janet would even know where Mrs. Betherall's place was because she lives in Edmonton. <laughs> oh, how interesting. I mean, yeah. she was an amazing horse. Oh, horse. totally. Yeah. Fabulous yeah. horses. And that's all that was known in those days, you know. But boy, I'll tell you, the problem was when a horse learns to buck, if anything startles them, that tendency, that's the go-to. And we can't afford, you know, it used to be when bucking horses out, oh boy, I, I can remember, you know, cowboys think, um, like boasting how many breaks they had. Well, <laughs> to no, thanks. Yeah. we don't need to get bucked off. And when I grew up, I'd love to know if anybody else had this. It was said that until you fall off or get bucked off 99 times, you can't be considered a good rider. Anybody else ever hear that? Well, I, didn't, I didn't hear it was, I, I thought I heard it was falling off. I thought it was like 25 times and then 50 times and then so on. But I mean, I, I think the thing is it's learning how to, if you do have to get off, how do you get off so you can potentially land on your feet or not get hurt? Yeah, you know well, about that, Linda. <laughs> I do. <laughs> I do. So I'd love to have some um, either like questions from you or just comments about those of you who have used some of this work and what your experience has been. I'm uh, just looking here. And if you don't know, like um, you can, you can either, we can see you all. So you can, oh no, we can't. Oh my goodness. No. We have 118 people on. Uh -huh. <laughs> I'm just looking at one screen. So there's a little hand down in the bottom. You can press that hand and then we can. Hey, and Naomi's here, I see, hi. Lots of people joined after. I was just gonna, I, I think I have a short video of showing the tail work on a horse if you want me to. Yeah, let's do that. Yeah, show, sure. let, I'm just gonna find it. I'm just gonna mute myself for a sec. And while she's doing that, while Robin's showing that, I'm going to find, I want to show you some T-Touch work on a horse that made a huge difference to him. Um, just in one session, it was a horse that in the arena, he was really nervous about uh, in, in, uh, other horses coming past him or toward him or, um, yeah, or near him. And what a difference one body, one T-touch session made to him. And I have this just, I have this I can put up right now if you want it. Great. And Theodora, I see you. Great. And someone else. Okay, go ahead with that one, Robin. Sir. So, 
So I'm just doing, I just wanted to work to his hind end. And then um, he, he was perfectly uh, content to just stand in there. And I just, so I just ran the video camera and started with the stroking as Linda was talking about a little bit. And one of the things to think about is that hair, the tail hair is an extension of the nervous system. We don't think about that. So uh, actually the question was about if a horse has been driven, do they have a trouble with a neckline driving? They don't because we don't hold on it. On a, when they're driving, there's a constant pull and the, the whole thing with the neckline driving, there's a little signal and, and it's on the melt or the release that the horse actually stops. So now I'm just picking up the hair. He has massive hair. So I pick up the hair on the top of the tail and I just circle it in both directions. And I just added a little glide on it. You can see the movement through his top line. See how his whole body moves. And the abdominal muscles actually are activated. This guy has navicular, so I have, um, I have uh, gel, gel pads on him, which has helped him. He's 25 or 26 or maybe 28, I don't know, something like that. But it was nice how we could turn around and that's so nice with the tail work if you can let them turn their head around and look back at you. So you could see the response on, on the front end. So that sort of movement of the mouth and so on certainly means he's feeling something through the body. Now I've just picked the tail up and I'm circling, I'm sort of lifting with my upper hand and just circling it in both directions. Then I'm gonna do a little press toward and there's a little pause and then I come back and you can see his whole body moving you can see he's kind of interested in what I'm doing because he can certainly leave whenever he wants. So anyway, I'll just, I'll just stop that. Oops, can I stop that share? So we have a couple, I'm just reading the, uh, reading in the chat. Yeah, yeah. I lost it here a moment. Uh, there were some really uh, good questions and comments. Oh, yeah. But now I lost. Well, I've got them. I've got them here. Oh, um, okay. So um, the uh, the tail. So it was one is about should we assume that every high headed horse, even those with breed characteristics, should have their head brought down? Yeah, I would say so. And but most of those horses, like Frisians and Arabs, what you have to do is bring the back up so they can release the head and neck. And I think that's that's. It's 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 like any kind of cross training you would do. You don't keep your posture. It, like in, in one posture, you want to be able to actually change it. So I, I think it's super important. I don't know about you, Linda. Well, I do know, you do know. So. Ab absolutely. And the thing is opening the shoulder because yeah. that, that combined with the, the leg exercises, yeah. opening the shoulder and doing the neck rocking, which just this wonderful movement, which really develops trust. This second T in T-Touch stands for trust. And when you can get a horse to just take the net, the, top, the crest and the underside and rock it back and forth like this, and the horse keeps the head level, you attain a different connection to that whole horse. And this, this business of doing the tail, that was just to start with the hair slides. Like somebody wrote to me and I'm going to ask them to do a Zoom session with me because they've got a horse who really kicks badly. And I, I wanna see you know, what this horse is around the rest of the body. But the, the, what I do with the horse like that, I just take the tail, take it out of the tail groove to the side and do these, these really intentional slides on the tail. The reason I take it out of the tail groove, if a horse is going to kick, um, <laughs> 19, I think it was 80, I read mm -hmm. one sentence that completely changed my mind. Because if you worked with me in the 80s, if a horse kicked, I would give them a whack, man. But after I read that, I stopped that. Or if a horse bit, you know, wait a minute, stop that. Mm. Now, what changed my mind is this concept that aggression, which is kicking or biting, seen as aggression, comes from a place of fear. 
And that's our whole system is step by step that is shown in this book. You can retrain or train a horse. So there's never any fear. And all these disciplines of taking the tail and just, I remember four year old uh, warm blood stallion that we had in a big training in Germany in the 80s. Yeah. Um, and late 70s actually. And I just, he was a kicker trying to protect himself, probably groomed too hard, which is a really common reason that horses start to protect themselves. And just taking that, sliding that hair like that, that's where I had a neurologist in my training who was, and said, think of that tail hair as an extension of the nervous system, which is the same information we got in a wonderful um, interview that Robin did with Sally Morgan. Um, on the effects of the tail work on the cranial sacral fluid, which is what we're also affecting through that whole spine with the various aspects of the T-touch work. Robin, if you can look at some of the other yeah, questions. Yeah, I am. There are, there's a, there's a, some questions. So one is if they clamp their tail, do you work through it? Well, you actually just, one of the things that, you notice that I stood from the side of the horse and I that those hair slides can be fantastic of getting horses to release the tail. The other thing I sometimes do if they're super clamped, I just take the hair on the tail and I gently roll it in the tail groove. So I don't try to pick the hair up out of it because if you stick your hand under there, man, they can clamp their tail. So I just roll it very, very gently in, and I'm talking like, you know, millimeters to just let them know they can and then do the, the hair the slides and then if you take the hair on the top of the tail and just gently start to move it that it's it's rare the horse that you can't kind of work through that with and i like to also just add little tiny raccoon touches just yep. Yep. after the hair slides yep. along the sides and generally uh, you know they release the fear and just like uh, start to allow you there and as robin said N never put your hands underneath there, uh, underneath that tail, unless you know that horse really, really well, and they already lift the tail when they yeah. feel something because they cl they can clamp. Yeah, mm -hmm. and I, even down the buttocks, like you don't have to even be on the tail, but the raccoon touches down the buttocks sometimes can also help them to release the tail. Um, so then somebody said, I've done some mouth and nostril work with the fearful pony today. He was then compelled to bite the lead rope. Could be his own release. It also, biting the lead rope, if he'd been really tense in the mouth, may have been kind of a release. Sometimes it's also a coping mechanism. That's that what I see, I would say, a lot of the time is that if they're, if you look at what's happening to them at the time or just before, it's a, it's a way that, of coping for them. Um, and, and then, Robin, I'd like yeah. to say something about yeah. that, because at Texas A&M, it's been 30 years ago now, there was a statement made that this thing of biting on the rope, you know, lipping at things was a sign of stress. And we never heard the word stress before mm -hmm. that in the horse world. So it mm -hmm. is stress mm -hmm. and people just think, well, the horse is just spoiled. Well, and uh, you know what I, I look at it is, if we look at, you know, people think about fight and flight and, you know, in horses and freeze and fool around is that mouthiness that is a domesticated compliant horses form of fight and flight. Yeah. It, it, I mean, in a, in a way of it, just that they, they're just coping and responding to, um, to the situation. So it's just pay attention to when it's happening and people will say the horse is bored, but if you stop doing what you're doing, sometimes suddenly they're not bored anymore. So the, one of the questions is, what do you do if they pin their ears back? Oh, you know, if it's, is it when they're, I'm not sure if it's when they're working the tail, if they're pinning their ears, well, first of all, you're always to the side. Um, I, and I, I know the horse I, that she's talking about, but a lot of times she's just listening to things that are go, going on behind. But it, when she, um, you can also work the panis reflex, which which I will show you, Maddie, when you're out here. Because some horses, they have just um, learned that as a defense, mostly around other horses, and so they don't really mean anything, um, uh, read anything by it. I'm uh, trying uh, to get to my desktop so I can show you. Keep an, an yeah, yeah, I am. I'm just going. Um, and then somebody had just talked about somebody that was when you were at Happy Dog. He was only halter broke, terrified of anything around his rear end. Uh, oh, Linda showed how he was disconnected front to rear and, le and left to right. By day two of 
of three, he was walking calmly, being driven through all sorts of obstacles. He, I learned how to use the uh, body rope. My trainer taught him to drive from the sur single, not the halter. Uh, oh, I see. Attaching the lines to the sur single. Mm, that's interesting. Oh, which reminds me, Robin, I didn't say <laughs> we don't drive the horse. We don't turn the horse off in that, off the neck. Can I just say one thing, though? Yeah. I have found, I do, I actually have found it works really well because you slide up the line and it actually gets them turning from the neck. I used to say that too, but I found it works actually, yes, you still have someone at the head generally, but it works brilliantly to use the, the balance rein, like from the neck rein, to actually turn them. I, right. Yeah, so I was, I was thinking what's missing there is adding the second rein just before if it was a young horse that hasn't right. been driven. So we add right. the rein onto the halter. So you're actually driving with four reins. Uh, yeah, right. But let's let them start with one, two, <laughs> start with, yes. But if you don't have a sur single, because we also do drive using the sur single as well, if you have them. Um, so this is why Dell's Pony recently became very reactive, bolting and spooking frequently, which is unusual for him. So uh, we discovered he has feather mites and are treating them. Ah, oh, feather mites can be so distracting for horses. In the meantime, are there any touches we could use? He's very reactive when we work around his hind end, threatening to kick, We've done circles on his TMJ and hindquarters. I would say use the wand to stroke his legs is one of the things. And you can, or you know, some sort of a stiff dressage whip. And then you can actually use it to do touches around the area where they have feather mites. They're super itchy usually when, when they have that. Um, just be careful. So obviously you want to pay attention to his signals that he gives you, but, um, and hair and hair slides on his tail might, might be helpful. Just stay to the side and, and be sure you're paying attention to him. What do you say you can add to that, Linda? If I'm sure I'm looking for my, for uh, my Oh, the picture. Okay. Sorry. Oh, I'm looking for the video um, with, um, Fabio, so they can see a little bit of tea touch on a horse in the stall. And I, oh, I've got so much stuff on here. I can't find it. I'm very disappointed. Maybe we'll do another session. We'll line up all of these. Yeah, there's a, yeah, there's a lot. There's lots of comments. You have them. Can you? What? You didn't send them to me. When? When? Yeah. Oh, a couple of weeks ago. Fabio. It's a video. It's a five minute video of Fabio. <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure. I don't, I'm not sure where it is. I'll, I'll, I can, okay. I can look. I can look if you want to go back to the questions. Okay. Uh, so you want to, uh, if you want to go to the questions, then yeah, I will I look. I will uh, do it. Chat, where are you? Let me get back to the chat. Sorry. Oh, uh, yeah. Somebody had said that they'd use T Touch as a part of massage therapy. I've I have to get used to the light touches with the pictures you show. I can see the difference before and after T touch. When I use it, I don't, I have trouble seeing an effect. Well, it depends on what you're working on for one thing. And um, it's, you know, it wasn't just, you know, part of it was depends on the issue with the horse um, and, and what, what your sort of skill level is knowing where you're going to go with it. I think that's also important. Did you find your I chat yet? Well, I can't. I'm trying to pull it up. I've got uh, all these participants listed and something. My but isn't different. your chat at the bottom? Yeah, it, it, it just, is. Oh, okay. But, it, but I can't. Um, I can just see a few lines at a time. Uh, you know, one of the other things is that if you have a horse that has a straight, like a, a sudden change in behavior or you get a horse, Ruth was saying that her horse turned, I mean, the horse had ulcers. There's, I mean, there. you really have to look for any underlying physical problems like the Dale pony with the mites, the behavior change suddenly, there's going to be a reason. Horses do not wake up in the morning and say, I think I'll really cause a problem today. And so you have to look beyond the behavior. Behavior is a form of communication. Um, so this is interesting from Ruth. Did she, you already say when I was looking, I just got a horse. Yeah. Yes, I, I did. That was what I was talking about. Yeah. Okay. Just carry on, and I'll look for the you know, I, I video. Don't wanna start. We, I don't want to stay on much longer because we just wanted to do this. Yeah, no, I need, yeah, I, I need to I know, actually. To know what can change? I bought a horse many years ago for very little money because he was a junior horse when I was in when I was at the West Wind Hungarian Horse Farm, 
and um, his name was Fighting Mad. Yep. <laughs> yep. And he he was said to bit and ki- bite and kick. He was a junior jumper. And I brought him home, and I changed his name to Jumping Jack, and the horse never, ever offered to bite or kick. Yep. I remember and that horse. Something, it wasn't that amazing, Robin? He was a wonderful jumper. Yeah. But it changed how everybody approached him because if they, you know, if the horse's f- name is fighting mad, people I'm sure would walk up and say, are you mad? Or you, you know, with a, an intention of sort of negativity. Teasing. Yeah. Right. Yes. And it's not always that easy, but it's yeah. amazing how, when you change your mind and what I'd like to do, um, I, w- I would just, um, are there any more on there? I can't see. I can only see like four lines. Right. right. I can't, yeah, I can't find the thing. But I think one of the things that I think um, you, Linda, it's been interesting. You've been doing like private sessions with people, like coaching sessions. So yeah. if people have like a horse or a dog or whatever that they wanted to have some help with you, they could get in touch with you and she'll do a Zoom session with you. So um, that's a that's an option that people can have in terms of getting uh, getting online help with their horse. And um, I, I, don't, I don't know if you charge by the hour, how you charge, but there's a, um, yes, it's by the hour. really, yeah. really helpful for people. And the changes that people have seen are remarkable. And, you know, I think we should do this and because the question is about the Liberty Ring. And that Liberty Ring is so mm. incredible. I'll just make one comment about it. And that is, I, I showed this uh, at a big um, dressage table in Germany. And there was a dressage trainer there from Austria. And he said, after he saw the effects of the rider using this balance rein on the horse, he said, every one of my students is going to have one of those. Because the difference is when instead of, you know, um, pushing the horse up into the bit, shortening them, tightening their body, this balance rein just brings the back up, allows them a completely different way of being and another time we should do it and talk about um how i came up with that (laughs) well and it it releases i mean it releases the head and neck so you get a telescoping and the bottom line softens and the top line lengthens and that's the and and the the neck ring which is what she asked about is um is is certainly part you know like is part of that um but it's different it's just two different different effects in terms of what they do but somebody's asking about um, head and body to get evaluations. Yes, that is one of the things that we're um, that we are going to do actually in one of the in one of the meetings. So if we had pictures, we need good pictures from the front, the side, and of the head and the side of either side of the body because they can look different left to right, and preferably under, under saddle. saddle. Yeah, if you're riding the horse. Yeah. No, someone else asked about the balance rein. So they're, as Robin said, they're very different yeah. the effects of the balance rain. So we're going to leave you. I know you all have stuff to do and we'll do this again. And it's really fun, Robin. It's really fun having this opportunity to work like this and share this with all of you. Super, super. Yeah. You know, I, I'd like to just end with a heart hug. <laughs> if you don't know it, because what it does in this proof, with all of the pressure that we hear of what's going on around the planet, even where, if, where you are is okay, it still affects us. And by putting one hand over the other, and if you, for some reason, you don't like to do this here, so there are some reason you know, that people don't. If you, you know, if your breasts get in the way, you can also do this down on your belly, and it also works. The thing about doing it right here on the center, which is your heart chakra, it's like a personal hug. And in this day and age, when we're not getting the hugs that we would really like to get, you can bring this feeling to yourself. That's why I called it the heart hug, because I first did this, I first named it that after working with children, orphans in Soweto, and find that when they imagine the face of a clock here, and the reason you imagine, you put on the numbers, like you just take that clock off the wall, (laughs) for those of you who had them in school, six is toward the ground, nine to the right shoulder, 12 toward the chin, and three to the left shoulder. And just very gently move the skin in starting at the bottom at six, in whichever direction you prefer, whatever, however your hands go. 
one circle and a quarter. Just try the other direction. See if that, and you just move the tissue very softly. No pressure. The lighter, the better. And it can be, it can be a really tiny one too, but big breath in through your nose and out through pursed lips. And I am consciously smiling because when I stretch the lips in a smile, it activates the feel good hormone, the serotonin. And moving the tissue activates the oxytocin, the trust hormone. Uh, and just think now of something for which you're really grateful because gratitude overrides fear. And just count your blessings every day. And one of my blessings is having this opportunity to share with you in this way and um, celebrate the magic of having animals in our lives. Thank you all. Aloha. Thank you. Bye.